Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to echo those sentiments of rain. Um, my wife sports in water resources, so she's always like, yeah, more rain, more rain, more rain. No drought, fantastic. Um, but I, I, <coughs> one of the things that I wanted to also kind of pray for is um, we have a, a, a good number of people who, who are expecting um, and, you know, that's really an exciting time. For those who already have, like, grown children, I know it's hard to think back, but, man, it's exciting. I know they may not think that way, um, but it's really exciting. And I, I want to just, just kind of say I'm praying for you guys. You know, just like, oh, man, oh, what is he or she going to be like? You know, it's just so exciting. And, and during, even during these times, you know, we really want to pray for those who are expecting uh, their next child. So with that said, hey, let's go to our passage for this morning. <clears throat> it comes from 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, <coughs> Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Astoreth, the goddess of Sidians, and after Milcom, the abonition, uh, abon, abonition of the Ammonites, so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David, his father, had done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us here. Lord God, truly, we are really blessed. You know, not only do we have many of the things in our life, but, Lord God, you give us so much more. And, Lord God, may this day be unto you. May nothing get in the way of the worship that you deserve. You deserve our attention, our focus completely. And, Lord God, I want to lift up those who are expecting. Lord God, um, protect the child. Guide the parents. May you already equip them to not only be wise in what they do, but more than that, Lord God, may they, they be wholly <coughs> devoted in raising their family in the way that you would want them to. Lord, we thank you for all the brothers and sisters that have gathered and those who can't. We ask, Lord God, that they may be in worship with you as well. So, Lord, thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. I said that if you are living in India, <coughs> you have many choices. And what I mean by that is you have many choices in the Hindu religion of how or who to worship. Conserver conservatively, there are some who say there's 33 gods in India or in the Hindu religion. Some say it's up to 300 million gods. So let me give you a, a sampling of, of the way uh, some of the Hindus worship. An elephant is considered and called by Hindus as Lakshmi. Are, are you guys familiar with this? Yeah? The goddess of wealth and prosperity. A swan is the goddess of learning. And a buffalo is the god of justice and death. Monkeys are god as well. They are worshipped for their strength and their loyalty. 
So that's why if you ever if you ever been to India, monkeys are not touched at all because it's considered a, a, a bad thing to touch them. So as Christians living in America, now we hear about these things, right? We hear about practices of bowing and worshiping a buffalo or a swan. And we kind of chuckle or maybe laugh at this idea. Because we go, hey, isn't that idol worship? We, we, we read about someone that seeks out Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, and scoff at that notion. We kind of go, like, haha, yeah, I, I would never do that. Christians will look at the practices and call it for what it's what really is. That's idol worship. So we know that as Christians, we're not to worship idols like goddesses of wealth or a buffalo, the god of justice. For that matter, anything other than our Lord, our God. But I do believe we do worship idols. I believe, maybe not purposely, but innocently enough, we are idolaters. Sometimes not on purpose, but we make the same mistakes that Solomon made. And with the reading and the study of these passages, I hope that we, we, we start trying to avoid the slippery slope that Solomon got on. And as we read at the end of his life, his heart was not wholly devoted to God. We want to study these passages so that we would be not like someone that slips to like Solomon. So what is an idol? It is anything receiving worship other than the one true God. It, is, it could be anything. Human beings can become our gods. There's even a show, right? You know the show, right? It's called American Idol. Right? Oh, man, okay, we want to be American Idol. Hey. And, we, and, and let's be honest, we sometimes worship them. Inanimate objects can be our idols. Like it says, there may be over 300 things that are idols. Idolatry is, a, is the worship of an idol. Living, dead, plastic. I read a, about a woman who so far has had 11 surgeries for the sole purpose of looking like Barbie. Yes, the doll. You know, the, the kid, the, the, the little doll that your uh, five-year-old daughter used to play with, right? Her goal is to look like Barbie. And I say surgeries counting because as she gets older, what's going to happen? She's going to look less like Barbie. So what, she, what does she need to do? Get, get her face done, her body done. And you go, oh, my gosh, that's, that's sad. But that is another form of idol worship. And, 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 and I, I know, I'm a, I'm, I hope none of you are getting surgeries because you want to look like Barbie or G.I. Joe or a, or a Smurf. I don't know, okay? <laughs> because in some ways we go like, that, that sounds ridiculous. But as we read about King Solomon, again, there is a slippery slope that is gentle, but yet it is leading down to that road. He is a son of King David and a Bathsheba. Yes, that Bathsheba. He becomes king in 970 B.C. Solomon is beloved and is a very successful king. He, he is in many ways one of the most powerful, most successful kings ever in the history of the nation of Israel. He loves God, and as we know, he is the wisest man on earth. Because, because of the fact that when he first became a king and he said, you're going to be king. The first thing that he sought was to have the wisdom. Have the wisdom of God. He sought God and said, God, I want to be as wise as possible so that I may be a good and faithful king. And God is pleased with that. God loves the idea that Solomon is asking for wisdom, not for riches, not for glory. And God gives him this blessing. And, it's, and, it's, and, and this, this blessing is the ability to apply knowledge to everyday reality. 
That is wisdom. It is simply applying what you know to the best course of action. For instance, <clears throat> I know my dogs love to eat. They eat everything. One of my dogs, Boba, enjoys eating other dogs' poop. They love eating. It does not matter. I know. I know. You're like, what? That's disgusting. That's what I say. But they still do it. They love to eat. They are driven to eat. They have very little discernment. Other dogs poop. Grass seeds does not matter. And they would eat as much as they can. And they have. So, having that knowledge, would it be wise to have my son's birthday cake around them? No, that would be not wise. That would be silly. I should place it in a place where they could not get to or reach. That is the wise thing to do. That is wisdom. I know my dogs are crazy eaters, and I don't want my dogs to eat my son's birthday cake. So the wise thing is put it in an appropriate place. So God gifted Solomon with an extraordinary wisdom. And if a situation arose, he could use that wisdom, that God-given wisdom. So he is so wise. His wisdom is so well known that royalty from other nations come and seek his counsel. And this, this monarchy is amazing. But again, in the beginning, Solomon is dedicated to the Lord and seeks to please him. But da-da, we get to verse 1. And now King Solomon says, loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, and Hittite women. All right. Solomon has become king and has become very successful. He has led Israel into the greatest expansion of its territory ever. I mean, if you study any kind of history in Israel, you go to Israel, go to Hebrew University, they marvel at Solomon. Because he did for that country what no other king could do, time of peace and prosperity. But as I said, he developed a strong desire for women. Women from what is now Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, and Syria. That does not include the women of Israel. Now, we could call it many things. He desired, he lusted, he, many things. But he loved women. I like women. I have one. I have a wife. Okay. But this dude had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He loved women. No, that's not, that's not, that's not even the right word. It's lusted after women. And, 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 and women, okay, you're more beautiful than men. You're, you're more alluring than men. So I can see why uh, Solomon did that. I was like, oh, man, they're more pleasant to be around. My, uh, my, my wife's skin is a lot softer than mine. I'd rather touch her than I would touch me. Like, it, it's just much better. So he was really allured by this. And it, and it brought him pleasure to be around so many women. And he would place all his women, uh, be wise princess, and he would put them in, in various places throughout his kingdom. So when he would go visit up north into the Galilee region, he would have three or four there. Then he would go to Capernaum, and he would have three or four there. And he would place all these women throughout his empire. Did he have his favorites? Absolutely. But in taking women from various countries, Solomon was disobeying God. God told him, do not marry the women for these nations because their mentality is to worship other gods. It wasn't the fact that they were Jordanians or Lebanese. God is not telling us today that we should not marry people from other nations. What God is saying is that for Solomon, he got what? 
he got lured away from God. He got lured away from the ones that he loved, his priority. And taking these women from various countries, God told him, don't marry these women because they will lead you astray. <coughs> Unfortunately, he does not listen. The wisdom that God gave to Solomon, he does not use. Okay? So he's the wisest man on earth. But what does he do? He ignores to use it. Because why? He is blinded by lust. He is blinded by his own desires. And that should be a lesson to us all. When you use your gifts for God, you will build a closer relationship with God. The less you use your gifts, the farther you will be. And as we read from the account of Solomon, we discover there are two forms of idolatry. The first one, go back. Boy, so far apart. Okay, there is what's called actual idolatry. And it is defined as spiritual worship given to other than the true God. Solomon is so enamored with his 700 wives and 300 concubines that he wants to be near them. Right? Th those, those who are married, those who have like th that wonderful girlfriend or boyfriend, right? Like, you, like, like oh man, I want to be around him or her. Solomon was enamored with women. He wanted to be around them. He liked everything about them, the way they smell, the way they feel. It's like, oh, I want to be around them. He wants to interact with them. Right? I, I, and one of the things that I love about my wife is when she does this with her hair. I really love that. That's why when she got short hair, I was like, oh, oh man, that sucks. It's like, what do you think? I was like, uh, I, I, I like long hair. Oh, I don't like long hair. Guys, you understand, right? Women have certain powers over men. So when she does that, I was like, oh, that's so awesome. I want to see that again. Like, I, I wish I had YouTube. Oh, that's so awesome. Over and over again. Same thing with Solomon. He was, oh, I'm enamored with these women. The more I'm around them, the more I want to feel good. So when they said, oh, I want to go worship Asterisk, the God of fertility, he was like, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you are, that's where I want to be. So he would follow them. And being the, the guy that loves this woman, he just did whatever she wanted. Was he a leader of the household? No. Was he a, a spiritual leader for his wives? No. So what does he do? He falls and follows them and does what they do. And that is actual idolatry. You actually go into a temple or a place and worship. And I want to make it clear. Um, I, I visited other countries. I visited Muslim nations to do missions work, to do evangelism. And I visited one of the largest um, Muslim ever in, an, uh, in um, Malaysia. I mean, it was ginormous. And they said, okay, I wanted to go visit, and my team was there. We want to kind of like explore. We got our, like, like, like kind of like a cloak or like a robe, and they said, you got to wear this thing. I was like, okay, that's okay. We're just here to visit. We want to we wanna be appropriate. We don't want to cause offense. So we went and we were just looking, but at no time did we worship. And that's the thing. You could go visit. My son has worshiped as part of his school project. But there's a difference of worship. And that's what Solomon did. He got down on his knees, offered sacrifices, and that's what he did. And God says, don't do that. And I don't think any of you do that. I don't think you go to a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever. 
But this is what I think what we do. The second form of idolatry is called figurative idolatry, which means, give it to me, desiring something above God or prioritizing something above God. Which is a sense that you want something above God or you prioritize something above God. And I believe Christians do this regularly and often. In verse 4, we read that because of some wives, Solomon turned to other gods. But as you read, the second part of that statement, it says that some of the wives caused Solomon not to be holy, holy, again, Wholly devoted to God. So Solomon says, I love God. I love Yahweh. He is my God. But I also love these women. And when, the, when she does that hair thing, oh, man, my heart. Oh. So what does he have? His heart is kind of torn. It's split. I, I want to worship God, but I like being around these women. And, and these women are, 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 are worshiping the god of fertility, is worshiping Molech. Oh, I want to be, I know, I'll do both. I'll worship God, and I'll worship with them. And God has lost the priority from Solomon. Verse 2, it says, Solomon clung to the wives. Okay, clung is not the idea that I'm just going to hold on. Timmy's always sitting here. He's like, I'm going to hold on to you, woman. But it's also emotional, mental. He clung to them emotionally, mentally. So when they said, oh, I want to go worship Moloch, emotionally, mentally, he clung on to them. And as a result, he worshiped their God. There's nothing wrong with emotionally, mentally clinging to your wife. We're, we're supposed to be that. It says to be one. And that's what he does. He becomes one with, this is an amazing thing to me. He became one with 700 wives. That's just, I, I can't, I have one wife, and, and, and that's hard. He has 700. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine, could you imagine his honey to-do list? Man, it must be humongous. You have 700 lists. But here he is, clinging, becoming one with 700 different wives. And he was torn apart. He was torn apart. And when it said, hey, I want to go here. Oh, sure, I'll go with you. I want to go worship this. I'll go with you. So he, he literally was torn in half. And as, as the years went on and on and on and on, his heart was torn into literally millions of pieces. But I, I'm assuming there was a moment where Solomon said, hmm, you know what? I think this is kind of wrong. I believe that there was a moment where he said, you know what? <sighs> she, she's going to go worship Moloch but I'm supposed to worship God. And he had that internal debate. But once he crossed that threshold, oh, it's okay, this one time. It became easier to do it the second time. It became easier to do the third time. And the fourth and fifth time, it was like, ah, whatever, I did it before. Nothing bad ever happened to me. That's the trap. That's the trap. You do it the first time, ooh, guilt, oh, man, it's tough. The second, third, fourth, fifth time becomes easier. We fall into that. We fall into that. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, our family deals with that all the time. Uh, ever since... My son was seven years old. He was playing a very high level of youth baseball, and now he's playing a very high level of youth basketball. We have these big tournaments, 
and, and baseball tournaments takes for hours. We had, uh, when we were in Kansas City, tournaments will start Friday afternoon, Saturday. And if you do really well in your bracket, you go to like the, the, the championship bracket on Sundays. And we would sit there going, oh, God, what should we do? And, and I'm a pastor, right? right? I'm a pastor. And I, would, and I would say like, oh, man. Part of me says, oh, man, if, if he wins this game, we're going to the championship bracket. Part of me says, Lose. But the competitor says, no, win, win, win. And then I remember my wife said, what are we going to do if he wins this game? They're, they're going to be at the championship bracket, and it could go on and on and on. I said, let's, God's will be done. <laughs> were there times where there were compromises, potential compromises? Yes. And my son would look at me and say, Dad, we're in the semifinals. And it's at 11.30. That's right during our worship. And I said, son, you can't play that game. You can't play that game. But, Dad, we're going to play that team from Texas. They're really good. And if we beat them, we'll go to the finals. You can't win. When you go to church, pray that you win. That after, after worship, if you can go play the championship game, if you get to the championship game. And the sad thing was, they didn't get to the championship game. And, and, and the other kids were like, hey, Micah, where were you? Where were you? The first time it was hard for him. It was hard for us. Because I want my son to be in the championship game and get those little medals, right? Ooh, look, I got a medal. But after a while, he understood. He understood who his priority was. It was God. And I tell him, son, you have a great arm. You can throw that ball hard. You're quick. You can catch that ball. There's a reason why you're in center field, because you're fast. You get to the ball fast. You catch, you can throw the guy out. But who gave you that gift? Who gave you that arm? Who gave you the instincts to throw that ball and get that kid out? Don't forget the hand that gave you those gifts. And when you disregard him by saying that one day that God has given us to say, go worship. And I, I don't even say like one day. How about just an hour and a half? Give me one and a half hours in the entire week to say, Lord, I want to worship you. And you say baseball is more important. We forget the hand that gave us. And I, tell, and I told my son, you can't do that. Have there been sense of like, okay, go worship early? Yes, we had that opportunity. Absolutely. But we have to say, God has given me this day to worship. And nothing should get in the way of that. Because all that I have and all that I am is because of God. And to say that, oh, yeah, baseball is more important, basketball is more important? No. No. It's not that God will be angry at us, but I think it's sad in his heart. To say that, let's be honest, 80-year-olds playing soccer or 80-year-olds playing baseball, is it really that important? Oh, maybe that is that one opportunity that he could get a college scholarship. Trust me, there are no college scouts at an eighth grade baseball game. But we think it's so important. More important than God? No. Now, are there opportunities that sometimes cause us because we're traveling or something happens at work? Yeah, it happens. And that's not what the issue is. But what happens to Solomon is that the first time became three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. It became a regular life choice. What are you placing ahead of God? I had this really weird conversation 
So, you know, I was counseling uh, this family. And um, um, I, I, I asked him, I was like, you know, I, I noticed that there's some tension, right? And he said, and, and they're saying, yes, uh, yeah, there is some stuff going on. I said, what's going on? And, 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 they, and they proceeded to tell me that the wife just didn't like this one person at the church. I said, oh, wait, what's going on? Like, did they do something? They said something and whatever, whatever. And, and, and she proceeded, and she kind of like, you know, she was a little embarrassed by it. And she said, no, it's not like what anything he said, but just the way he looks, the way he behaves just bothers me. And I said, oh, is it because like, you know, and, and, and this one person is a little bit different. All right. He had a tattoo across his neck, right? Like, in, in any definition of looking, like, proper, he looks a little different. His clothing choices, a little different. So what, what she would say is like, oh, I don't want to be near him. I don't want to be around him. And, and she caused her husband to say, oh, don't go talk to him. He'll be a bad influence on you. So this is what I asked her. And I asked him first because he is the head of the household. I said, and that is his real name, Zuther. On one side is your wife. You love her. You really love your wife. And, I, and, I, and, I, and you want to support her with her opinions. Okay? There's your wife. But in the direct opposition to her is a passage called 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Direct opposition to your wife, brother, is Galatians 6.10. Therefore, we have an opportunity to let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is not a conditional clause, I told him. But too many times, we stand in direct opposition to what God is calling us to do. And that is something that is what we call figurative idolatry. Choosing a friend, our wife, over what we should be doing for the Lord. What we know is to be right. What we know is in honoring God, but in opposition to that is our friend that says, hey, fill in the blank. I do this all the time. I, I lived in Kansas City. I went to guest speak in Dallas, Texas, the home of the Dallas Cowboys, my favorite team. Ooh, I love the Dallas Cowboys. I loved them since 1976 when they had a man named Roger Staubach. They're so cool. They have a star on their helmet. How cool is that, right? And I remember to guest speak, and I was looking at the announcement of a church. I went to speak, and I was looking at a, a, at a bulletin. And, and the bulletin says, um, starting in two weeks, we're going to change the worship time. I was like, oh, that's weird. And I asked him, I said, well, why, are you change, why is that the church changing? He was like, oh, because NFL is about to start. And we don't want them to miss the Dallas Cowboys. I went, no, be quiet. They're not going to change the worship time because of football. They looked at me, no, no joking. Yes. It's like, oh, okay. Now, was there worship? Yeah. But I just thought it was so bizarre that they're changing worship time because of Dallas Cowboys. I thought it was kind of like cool because like, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. But the primary said, what? Are we placing things, people, and making God second 
third, fourth, fifth figurative idolatry. You may say, oh, it's innocent. Hmm, is it so innocent? So if you're really going to be a church, <clears throat> and I believe we all want to be a church, I believe that we all are, want to be a church that is a light. If you all want to be a church that says we're going to be a church that is really a church, that is, is of Jesus Christ, that loves the Lord and really wants to worship him and wants to be a community, our priority has to be God first. That, is, that has to be our priority. It, it can't be uh, kids' soccer, kids' baseball, or a boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, a wife saying, don't do this, don't do that. Our priority has to be God. And you may say, Pastor Lee, that sounds really hard. Yes, it is hard. And you'll be, you'll be faced with some difficult decisions. But I say choose wisely. Because the first time, hard. Second time, not so hard. Either way. First time, hard. But the second time, not so hard. Either way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And Lord God, I hope that we could be a church that prioritizes. Do we want to care for our loved ones? Absolutely. God, thank you for placing... Uh, husbands and wives, and Lord God, sons and daughters and grandparents and uncles, and Lord, sometimes we'll have to make hard choices. And Lord God, when life is at issue, Lord, you give us insight and wisdom. But Lord God, may we have a heart to say, God first. I, I, I really want to be a church that says God first. Will there be moments where we have to compromise? It will happen. But Lord God, may we always know God first. In our worship, in our Sundays, in loving our brothers and sisters, God shall be first. And Lord God, I hope that you will speak to us through your Holy Spirit. And Lord God, as Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane wondering, should I go through the pain? Follow God. We know what he did. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.